I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker, and we are co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And we're very happy today to have with us an award-winning photographer and filmmaker, Chris Johnson. Chris is author of the book, A Better Life, 100 Atheists Speak Out on Joy and Meaning in a World Without God. And he has a film by the same name. So, Chris, welcome to Free Thought Matters. Thank you, Dan and Annie Laurie. You made a beautiful book, beautifully illustrated, lavishly high-quality book there. To, it's just a, a thing of beauty to look at by itself. Oh, thank you. And it has not just photographs uh, of, of these hundred atheists, but also interviews of famous atheists, well-known atheists, and, as well as just airline pilots and mountain climbers and homemakers and coffee grinders and all that. Mm -hmm. So it's fascinating. There's nothing like that in existence. Why did you do this? Uh, basically because there was nothing like it in existence. <laughs> um, I felt that we needed something uh, in the atheist literature that was not just these are the arguments against the existence of God or this is why religion is harmful, but things saying this is how we see the world when there is no God. This is what you know, how we deal with the difficult questions in life, how we see the world, how we interact with other people, what's important to us when there is no God or no afterlife. How does that change how you see things? So I really wanted to focus on that and focus on creating something that was not just an intellectual piece, but an artistic piece, something that could sit on a coffee table and people could flip through and look at pictures of smiling, happy people as opposed to simply intellectual arguments. Because we have a lot of that in the atheist world. Um, but we don't have a lot of artistic endeavors. So you mean atheists are not just a bunch of unhappy, angry people <laughs> just mad at everyone? It, you know, shockingly, no. <laughs> um, and it's amazing how widespread those stereotypes are. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that mm. people all over the world have that impression of non-believers. So that's what I was trying to do to combat those stereotypes. So the subtitle talks about joy. So when you went and met people, that's really what you were asking. You were saying, mm -hmm. what, what do you love? What do you love to do outside right. of your atheist advocacy? Um, and why, why that emphasis? Because I, I wanted to show the human side. Um, again, I think people often just associate atheist activism and atheist activists with you know, tearing things down, trying to, to remove religion from society in certain ways, um, or tell people why they're wrong. Um, but I wanted to show a more human side to show people that, you know, these are all people and they have joys and loves and passions and um, things that the, are really important to them. And in some cases, those things are atheist activism. It's important to be um, passionate about your work and passionate about the things that we do to make a world a better place. Um, but we're not just one dimensional. So I wanted to show the three dimensionality of all these people. Well, talking about three dimensionality, you're two-dimensional book became a movie by the same name. Do we have a trailer? We can look at the trailer of that book for here. Yeah. Atheists don't like our happiness. They don't want you to be happy. They want you to be miserable. They're miserable, so they want you to be miserable. Not believing in God was such a sea change of worldview that it changed my life fundamentally and forever. This idea that uh, some people have that atheists must be nihilists who have no purpose and they're all dour all the time and oh this life has no meaning and purpose and why don't we just end it all. I just, I cannot grasp that. The more I've understood about how the universe works, the, the, the more that awe has come and the more joy rather than it going, oh it's just clockwork the sun's there and we go around it every year and all that stuff. No, I think that's amazing how that, that is extraordinary how that's happened. Since we can contemplate ourselves and we are made of the stuff of the cosmos, by transitive properties, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. I certainly feel more liberated, that's, a, that's amazing. spiritualism or God or anything to explain that. I'm just like, wow, what a great place we live in. 
you make the standards, that you create the goals, that you decide what is meaningful or not. Once you get that, it's enormously freeing. As the cobblers used to say, work while you have light. So while you're here, while you have your 300 months, you must put all your energy into it. So there are a lot of famous people in your book and movie. Uh, Richard Dawkins, um, James Watson, James Randi. What was it like traveling around the world meeting people like that? It was an incredible experience, not only to meet people whose works I'd read or seen in different outlets, but, uh, but interact with them and have them be a part of a project that I was working on. That was really important for me and an incredible experience to be able to talk about um, issues that are important with people who have had such a wide variety of experience, whether it's someone like um, Richard Dawkins, who's written all these incredible books as a scientist, uh, to someone like Alex Honnold, who's an incredible athlete climbing around the world. Now, he, uh, he's been on 60 Minutes, Alex mm -hmm. Honnold. And you, wanna, you were fascinated with that story, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how I saw him, actually, was I saw him on 60 Minutes, and I thought, I wonder if this guy's an atheist. Um, so he hadn't talked about it? No, he no. I think sensed. I... Yeah, I looked it up online somewhere. I don't remember exactly where I found it, but he mentioned in some interview that, by the way, I'm an atheist, and that was it. Um, and so he, he's an incredible person. So he, he travels the world climbing, um, uh, living out of his van, and uh, he's just an incredible athlete, incredible person. Um, I mean, you should watch his 60 Minutes piece if you haven't seen it, because it's, it's really hmm. an incredible piece of, of um, athletics, what he's able to do. So mountain climbers and musicians and composers, you got to go into Charles Strauss's apartment in New York City, yes. right? The famous Broadway composer of Annie and mm -hmm. Bye Bye Birdie and all that. And you got to go into James Randi's house mm -hmm. and see all, you know. Which is fascinating. Yeah. Must Don't have been something him. like a, an anti-pilgrimage or something, you know, <laughs> to be able yeah. to do all that. Uh, yeah. It really did change my life. And it's one of the reasons why I'm doing the work that I'm doing, because I think uh, it's incredibly important to talk about these issues, um, not just with people who are famous, but with everybody. You know, how can people look at their own lives and think about things a little differently? If this is the only life you have, if there is no afterlife, there is no God, how does that change how you see things? How do you want to spend, you know, as A.C. Grayling says in my film, you'll have less than a thousand months mm -hmm. in your life. If you live till you're 80, what's 12 times 80? Less than a thousand yeah, months. Go. So how do you want to spend the precious months that you have alive? Or about two billion heartbeats, roughly. Two to three billion heartbeats. Yeah. Each one is, is, is gone, right? So, right. Yeah. So those of us who are not religious, of course, know they're... You know, there's no afterlife, there's no proof of one. Right. So that makes life more precious. Absolutely. Not less precious, but right. so often the stereotype is we have nothing to live for. Right, we have everything to live for, because this is it. And we'll be back with more Free Thought Matters after this. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Patrick, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. Nine years ago, I saw Dan Barker debate uh, Christian apologists uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, they were discussing the resurrection of Jesus and whether or not it was true. At the time, I was Catholic and was very convinced uh, Dan was wrong and that, in fact, the story was true. That debate prompted me uh, to take a course on early Christian literature and, I, in fact, learn more uh, and question my own beliefs. The more I read and the more I learned, the more I came to realize that I was being pretty much intellectually dishonest. Fast forward to nine years later, I'm now an employee at FFRF and uh, work for the vital mission of separation of state and church. I'm proud to be an out-of-the-closet atheist.
So of the non-famous people you met, who, who stands out? The non-famous people I've met. I mean, you just met some of the people you just photographed on the street, right? Yeah, people, I mean, I, I, I looked them up, knew them, um, but yeah, I wanted it to be a collection of people who weren't just kind of everyday, who weren't just famous people, but also, you know, people that everyone could relate to. Mm -hmm. So there's an airline pilot, for example, who's a friend of mine back in New York, who, I mean, w what an incredible job to just you know, fly above the clouds mm -hmm. all day. And that's and an incredible experience. God is not his co-pilot. It's not. I hope not. <laughs> does, does he ever see Jesus up in the clouds coming down? Uh, no, I don't no, think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And a rancher and uh, an opera singer yeah. and a homemaker. Uh, and, and the uh, coffee brewer who is, was she Sudanese working in uh, She's an uh, environmental activist um, and speaker, Nala Mahmoud from Sudan, who, I mean, just an incredible uh, story um, you know, having to move from Sudan because of death threats and things like that against her. It's, um, it's an incredible experience. But so she's pictured with um, coffee. Yeah, she loves coffee. We went to um, an uh, Eritrean coffee house in London. Um, and, um, you know, it's part of this whole ceremony that you do with the coffee. It's incredible. See, that's something we can all believe in, right? Yes. It's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, um, uh, it was movers and shakers, though, you did talk with a lot of atheist activists as well. Yeah. And um, did you have any, there, were there any surprising moments when you were interviewing people? Somebody said something totally unexpected, you wouldn't have expected an atheist to say? No, I can't think of anything too surprising. I mean, everybody that I spoke to, you know, nobody said, by the way, I believe in God. That would be a bit of a difficult thing. Oh, we have to stop the interview now. Um, <laughs> But no, nothing, nothing surprising. What was, what was great, though, was the variety, like I said. All these different people, different experiences, um, you know, things I never would have thought about. Trying a Bundt cake that you made, for example. It was, it was a wonderful little experience. Well, oh, because Annie that. Laurie's in the book, so that yeah. was her. She happened to bring that Bundt cake in just, just coincidentally. Coincidence. Yeah. Coincidence. And you photographed I love, it. I love <laughs> yes. And you had Dan at the piano. And Dan at the piano. Yeah. And... Um, um, but I wanted to ask you about people like maybe um, Penn and Teller. Yeah. What was that like? Well, hearing Teller speak at all is yes. pretty incredible. Right. Um, and so we had a, a wonderful conversation. He's a, um, uh, just an art articulate, um, interesting individual. And we're talking about art and science and politics and, and um, especially with the work that he does. Um, you know, how can he get his art across in a way that's not... Uh, vocal, um, which you know, is kind of a challenge when you think about it. And I know that the pic you've um, singled out the photograph of Greta Christina and her wife. Yes. And the, what's the significance of that for you? Well, that in particular was one of the most, um, I don't want to say interesting, but, but moving experiences that I had working on the book. Uh, I went to uh, interview Greta and photograph her and her wife Ingrid, and we had the shoot, and it it turned out lovely, and we have a really great photograph of them in the backyard of their house with this wall behind them with all these yeah. dishes on it. It was really incredible. It's very San Francisco. And, um, and it turns out, uh, I only found out about a week later, that she had been diagnosed with cancer 30 seconds before I rang the doorbell to do this interview. Uh -huh. And we, you know, I had no idea at the time. She only told me afterwards. So you were not the angel of death ringing the doorbell. You not were. that time, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, looking back at it, you know, here she was having just learned this news, and now she has to sit down and talk to me about life and death, and I'm, you know, uh -huh. I'm oblivious to everything. Um, and so she wrote about that uh, in the book. Um, it's just a really interesting experience to to hear about. And she's fine, by the way. She's she's doing very well. And the interviews in the book are just worth reading anyway. I was reading through the book uh, when I first got it, and one of our co-workers came by, and he saw this book of these big, full-spread color photographs, and I said to Scott, well, uh, I'm reading it for the interviews, basically. <laughs> and he laughed. <laughs> because it's, you know, it's both. You get the, you know, the stories and the, the philosophy and the mm -hmm. feelings, and uh, as you say, the idea that, like what Emily Dickinson said, that it never comes again is what makes life so sweet. And so let's enjoy this moment now, because this is it. Yeah. One of the things I'm most proud of about this project, both the book and the film, is the response from religious people. 
Um, yeah, I was going to ask that. How yeah, has it gone over? It's, it's incredible, actually. Um, I've had some you know, Christian pastors come up to me after screenings of the film and say, I, I came to this not really knowing what it was about. I knew it was about atheism, but that's really all I knew. And I think about things completely differently now. I've learned uh. so much about atheists, you know, watching a 90-minute film than I knew before that. Well, it's unusual for him to sit through that. Yeah. But so hopefully he's had some of his stereotypes um, debunked. Yeah. The evil atheist, the person who has no joy in their life and no meaning and purpose. Yeah, and he, he even made a video saying, all my religious friends need to see this movie. Well, that's quite an endorsement. <laughs> yes. Never thought I'd get that much of a ringing endorsement from the religious side, but I'm very proud of that. Well, it's deep, but it's also... Fun and funny. You have comedian. You have Leanne Lord, a stand-up comic, mm -hmm. and you have Julia Sweeney, and you have Penn and Teller, and you have that whole fun side of life as well. It's not right. just like we're a bunch of deep thinkers analyzing the ontological argument. We're living a, a rounded-out life. Yeah, I didn't want it just to be scientists because yeah. that's. I mean, we have some amazing scientists uh, in the book, but uh, if it were only scientists, I think that would perpetuate the stereotype that we're all scientific. Yeah. You but know. you do have a lot of really interesting scientists. I do, yeah. I Sean Carroll, Sean Lawrence Carroll, Krauss. Lawrence Krauss, and you also have our, the honorary president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, Stephen Pinker. Yes, Stephen Pinker. Who is married to Rebecca um, uh, Newberger, Newberger uh, Steve, yep. Goldstein. Yeah. And so they're pictured together, but they mm -hmm. each have their own section in writing. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and Donald C. Johansson, the discoverer of Lucy, and yes. James Watson, and uh, uh, some big names in science. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you did talk science. I did, yeah. I just didn't want to make it all about science, because I think sometimes we have that stereotype that we're all scientists. And, and then philosophy, too. A.C. Grayling and yeah. Daniel C. Dennett and yep. others. So we have all that balance in there. Huh? Yeah, I think balance is really important to show a, 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 a kind of a widespread view of our community. We're not just one kind of person. So um, let's talk about you a little bit. Oh, okay. Because you were talking about everybody else, and you learned yeah. a lot about other Rethinkers, but what was your what was your background? My background was uh, film production, so uh, I was I went to film school um, with a major in film production, minor in religious studies. Not because I was ever religious, but because I found it interesting what other people believed. So I'm definitely using both my major and my minor here. <laughs> so you project. never believed? I never believed. No, I was raised in a non-religious huh. household. My dad is a very liberal Christian, but we never went to church. We never celebrate any holidays really, um, never was told there was a God, kind of um, think for yourself kind of attitude towards when my brother and I were being raised. Well, you're like Annie Laurie. Yes, she was so raised in a non-religious... Yep, my parents felt that children should be allowed to grow up and, until they could understand religious concepts mm -hmm. and yeah. think for themselves. We were expected to think for ourselves, so I thought it was a real benefit. But mm -hmm. still, you have a, a driving need to talk about religion and atheism, or you wouldn't have put all this time into this book to kind mm -hmm. of change people's perceptions. Right. So was there something that set that off? Well, I think uh, a lot of it was studying religion. Um, so, you know, because I wasn't raised religious myself, I always found it interesting, oh, what do these other people believe? And so when I got mm -hmm. to college, I started studying more and taking more classes in religious studies. And just the more I studied about the different religions of the world, the more I thought, oh, well, this is really interesting material. Um, and really, all the other people believe these things? And why is that? And that's, you know, and it made me more identify with the atheist label at that point. Um, and that's also when the whole new atheist movement really started picking up steam. So it was a combination of all those different things combined. But I think that in the introduction of your book, you talk about being at White Sands. Yes. So that's where the idea for the book came from. I was taking pictures on a road trip with my brother, and my brother said, you should make a photography book. Um, and I said, well, why would I do that? Like, there's so many books out there. And he said, well, you just have to think of a way to make something different, something new. And it was being in that gorgeous setting. You know, where all you see is this snow-like sand. In New Mexico. Yeah, it's in New Mexico. And it's just incredible. A, spa a space that many people might consider spiritual, right? Um, and so I thought, well, what if we were to look at this from an atheist perspective? What do we look at beauty and joy and experiences yeah. like this from a non-theist worldview? Um, and then I thought, well, you know, there are all these wonderful, amazing uh, non-theists out there, why don't I showcase them in a photography book? And that 
that's how the project started. We'll be back with more Free Thought Matters after this. Hi, I'm Julia Sweeney and I'm a cultural Catholic. I'm no longer a believer and I even wrote a play about it called Letting Go of God. But I want you to know that right now the Catholic bishops have found their galvanizing issue. And it's not about fighting economic injustice or even about helping to keep their youngest members free from sexual predators. No. The issue that the Catholic Church has decided to focus their considerable political will, energy, and money on is the right to deny women contraceptive coverage. And not just Catholic employers, everyone. So an employer who's a Jehovah's Witness could refuse blood transfusion coverage for his or her employees, or a Scientologist employer could refuse to cover any type of psychiatric care or even medication, or a Christian scientist employer could refuse to cover, well, I guess, everything. It's an outrage. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation and help keep church and state separate. So you call the book a better life. Yes. Do, do atheists have better lives than theists? Or, or just that everybody's life is enriched when we realize the diversity? I think everybody's life is enriched once we recognize the diversity. Uh -huh. And I think your life means more when you realize that we only have a finite amount of time. Uh -huh. So I think that outlook is, in fact, better. Well, you're not spending money, you're not giving tithes, you, you don't have to spend all this time in church, you've got a lot more time and resources as an yeah. atheist, so in that sense, in that one way, it is much better. Yeah, I definitely think so. I can say that from experience. So. Right, you've had both <laughs> in, that, uh, in that respect. So your movie now, you were promoting the book uh, back when we first met you, but now you're on the road promoting the movie, you're doing screenings around... Did you get to South Africa yet, or is that one coming No, up? South Africa is going to be in October. Ah, okay. Yeah, but I've been to five continents now. Wow. Almost 100 cities around the world, all the way from Sydney, Australia, to the small island of Bornholm in the middle of the Baltic Sea. Wow. Um, uh, many different places. Well, we showed the film here mm -hmm. to a very appreciative packed house in our Free Thought Hall in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was quite an evening, and it was We just fast. didn't have you there, but... We didn't right. have you there, but... <laughs> so, I'm here now, though, yes, which is good. Yes. Um, so, um, are you being sponsored by various secular and free thought groups, or also universities? Uh, it depends. Um, anywhere anybody will take me, I will go. Um, uh, but five continents. Yeah, five continents, yeah. Um, it's usually local groups, local groups working together, or universities, things like that. Um, it's been a really great experience to, to travel all around and meet people, even though they have different religious or cultural backgrounds but feel that things like this are really important. So five continents, but so far just one planet, right? Just one planet. So well, far, not, Mars maybe. We'll, we'll see if that works yet, out. Yeah. Are there so, atheists on Mars, maybe? Yeah. Well, I, I, there's no theists on Mars, I can tell you that. <laughs> so are you working on something new? Uh, at, the moment, the, talk about? Uh, at the moment, the screening tour is my full-time gig. I'm mm -hmm. doing this at wow. least till the end of the year. After that... I'm not sure. We'll see. Maybe something exciting. But You're I'll a real let you know. missionary for free thought. I got to say, that. <laughs> <laughs> or an Thank apostle, you. an apostle of free thought. There you go. Yes. So, what did you learn in all of this? I certainly learned that um, you need to make the most of, of your life, and you know, doing a screening tour like this, um, going around, traveling, kind of being nomadic, um, it, it doesn't certainly make me a lot of money, but. It's so rewarding for me. That's, for me, that's the important thing. You know, I could be doing something else with my life that might be more financially lucrative, but this is really important to me, and I'd rather be doing something that I really love to do um, and work with all these incredible people and all these incredible groups and helping people around the world think about these things in different ways. That means far more than any kind of monetary value to me. Mm. 
So what is the message that you ideally want people to take away when they see the screening? To think about how they want to spend their life, to think about what is important to them. Think about their friends, their family, their relationships, how they spend their time. Are they doing things they really want to be doing? And focus, well, if I only have this amount of time, what do I want? How do I want to spend that? That's what I want people to think about. Because you're doing all of this, spending all this time and energy, with no prospect of some eternal future reward. This is the reward right now, right? Yeah. So talking to you, being yeah. here, this huh. is the reward for me. Huh. Well, and I also think, though, if someone was religious in the office, um, in, in the audience, what message? Again, that I think um, not only look at themselves and what they believe. I'm not trying to convert people, but. Although um, there's nothing wrong with There's nothing wrong with that, no, if that happens. But I don't want to kind of push mm -hmm. it as my goal. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, think about their atheist family members, their atheist friends, and maybe think about them in a different way. Maybe they've thought that they're evil or they, you know, why do they just um, rape and murder and things like that. Um, and maybe think about them in a different way. Think maybe they're, they're not so bad after all. But we know who really is doing the raping and the murdering. It's the believers, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the way the church is treating these children and all right. that. So, uh, why do we atheists get called fools? Why do we get the bad rap when it's actually the believers who are mm -hmm. doing all these crimes? Right, um, right. There are a few atheists who commit crimes, I think too. there's three <laughs> atheists, yeah, but there's probably three. <laughs> Slight exaggeration. Yeah. <laughs> but look at the prison population. Atheists are way underrepresented in the prison mm -hmm. population. And believers, for all their talk about morality, are, not, are no better mm. than non-believers. Well, what's so nice about your book, A Better Life, in the movie, is that... Atheists and non-believers are not on the defensive. Right. It's all positive. Mm -hmm. It's letting them speak about their views and their lives without having to constantly um, defend against the stereotypes. Right. Right. Uh, like we're Martians. Right. We're not really human. <laughs> we're second-class citizens. Um, yeah. And that really is unique and special. So we thank you very much for making that book. Thank and you. And for being our guest today on uh, We Thought Matters. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. You're one of our earliest guests on our new Free Thought Matters <laughs> TV show. So Thank you. Thank you. I'm good. really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Free Thought Matters is a production of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. We are a national association of atheists and agnostics working to keep religion out of government. And we invite you to join us at FFRF.org.